Our panel is gathered here tonight to discuss race relations in our country, with yesterday's election as the immediate backdrop. There's no doubt that race has influenced many key events in our nation's history, and certainly the campaign for the White House was a necessary reminder that the deep wounds of slavery have not been healed, and we continue in many ways to be divided, to be a divided nation, and one of those divisions is obviously based upon race. Our panel will explore events ranging from race relations in a racially segregated military during World War II to the influence of minority groups that have had on the election. Our panelists are simply perfectly qualified to drive deeper into these historical events and shed light on how race influenced each event. Our panelist is Joe DeGuardia, a Republican from New York who came to Congress in 1985 he represented the 20th New York Congressional District. And during this time, Joe worked together with his congressional colleagues and then chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Mickey Leland, to obtain medals of honor for African-American war heroes. He's still extremely passionate about this issue, as you could tell tonight in the reception, and came to us with this idea to host this panel discussion on race relations. Our next panelist is Steve Hortsford. Steve represents Nevada's fourth district as a Democrat from 2013 to 2015. Before serving at Congress, he served in the Nevada Senate, representing Clark County's fourth Senate district from 2005 to 2012. He served as Nevada's first African-American state Senate majority leader, as well as Nevada's first African-American congressman. Sam Fullwood III is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, where he analyzes the influence of national politics and domestic policies on communities of color across the United States. Prior to joining the Center, Sam was a columnist at the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, Ohio, the last stop in a nearly three-decade journalism career that featured posts at several metropolitan newspapers. Mr. Fullwood is the author of two books, Waking from the Dream, My Life in the Black Middle Class, and, full, and the other one is full of it, Strong Words and Fresh Thinking for Cleveland. Now, we also have Delegate, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, now in her 13th term as a Congresswoman for the District of Columbia. She is a ranking member of the House Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. Ms. Nort, Holmes Norton also serves on two other committees, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, and the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Before her congressional service, President Jimmy Carter appointed her to serve as the first woman to chair the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Ms. Holmes Norton is still a national figure for civil rights and feminist rights. Jeffrey Savons is an American historian <clears throat> and professor at New York University. His area of research includes African American history, military history, and sports history. Dr. Salmon's 2001 Research Fellowship at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture and History and the 2001 National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship simply led him to thoroughly research and co-author the book, Harlem's Rattlers and the Great War, The Undaunted 369th Regiment and African American Quest for Equality. My friends here tonight, we imagine this discussion we're going to have is going to be exceptional. And we therefore needed a skilled moderator to guide such a dialogue. We certainly have filled this position tonight with uh, Charlene Hunter Galt, award-winning journalist and author of numerous books on race relations. So you can imagine with his profound writings and journalism, journalism career, he makes a perfect individual to simply moderate this wonderful panel and this discussion. So please join all of Please join for me in welcoming the outstanding panel to the stage tonight.
much, Cliff, and um, I'm so happy to be on this stage once again. The last time I was here, I had a great time with the, a wonderful group of people talking about the South and desegregation and various other things. And uh, in a way, it gives me a backdrop for tonight because we have some of the same issues rearing their heads as we live in the moment. I don't, we, we, we have the results now, as you all know, of what has been a historic um, election. And I don't think I need to spell out why for this audience, because I peeped who was in the room. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, today there were big headlines all over various newspapers, including the New York Times. And one of them read, after the vote, a nation tinged with racial hostility. And I kept thinking, wow, that is true, sadly. But happily, we have an, a panel that can look at some of that. We're going to look at racism that dates back generations and now, and why it continues to be a problem. Before I get into the impact, though, of the current campaign, I want to do. I want to go back in history because we are in the National Archives, so we have to pay deference to its mission. And so I want to look at a couple of issues that put into stark relief the journey we've all been on as it relates to race, and then we will look at. Uh, the outcome of this campaign and what it will take to overcome now. So without further ado, we will be celebrating, I think as you heard a few moments ago, Veterans Day in a few days, and times have changed. But I want to go back uh, with you, uh, Mr. Diogordi, and can I call you Joe? Yes, you can. You sure? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I want to go back with you because you go back to a different time yes. when some of the veterans who were African Americans were victims of racism despite the fact that they performed heroic service in the military. And that takes us all the way back to World War I. Now, I don't think you were that old. <laughs> oh. but. In 1986, you got into this issue. Tell us briefly about that. You know, God works in wondrous ways. And as a new member of Congress, I got to meet Mickey Leland, chairman of the Black Caucus. He came to me one day, actually it was the year before 1985, after we were both on a TV program. They wanted to put a, someone from the South with someone from the North one party against another, maybe one race against another. They wanted to have some excitement. They didn't get that excitement. We agreed on a lot because we were of like minds when it came to serving all the people in our district. He represented Houston, an area with very rich people and very poor. I represented Westchester County, an area with some of the richest people in America and some of the poorest. And I inherited or got a very large African-American population. Well, in 1986, a uh, military historian, Dr. Leroy Ramsey, if you have the pamphlet we left out there, you'll see the whole story, came to visit me and said, Joe, you know, I had Governor Cuomo write the 34 members of Congress. Now we're down to about 27 or 28, but in those days, 34. And you were the only one to answer the letter I drafted for him telling the story. And he came to my office and I said, you know, let's go back over that story again, because I do remember it, basically, but I have a lot of questions. And he said, well, you know, in World War I and World War II, a million, 550,000 African Americans, black Americans served our nation, and not one got our nation's highest military award, the Medal of Honor. And I'm a CPA. I'm the first CPA ever elected to the US Congress, believe it or not. And that tells you a lot of people know how to spend. They don't know how to count. And that's one of our biggest problems today. Even when they know how to count, they're not using the right accounting system. But 
he went on to say that hundreds were recommended. But Joe, I came here for one person, Henry Johnson, Albany, New York. I've been trying for years, and I'd like to see if you can help me do something. You answered the letter. And I said, you know, I'm going to have my staff now research a lot of this. I was so convinced after that research that this was a blatant, egregious violation of justice, certainly racial justice, that I went to my now good friend, Mickey Leland, and I said, you wanted me to help you. You needed a Republican to testify in front of the Ag Committee to beat down President Reagan's executive order eliminating food stamps. And yes, that's good for my district too, but I now need you. When I told him the story, he says, Joe, this is great because I've been looking to get a medal for Seaman Dory Miller from Texas. I thought he was from Houston. It turns out he's from Waco, Texas. So we got together and we started raising hell with the Pentagon, with other members of Congress. We put in two bills to open up the statute of limitations. Believe it or not, five years goes by. If someone's recommended and nothing happens, you can't do anything. You have to go to Congress to open that statute. Had any of these people been recommended before? Oh yeah, everyone had to be. You can't get a medal unless someone recommends you. But nothing had happened. And, 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 and then you have, you need witnesses. And all that is recorded. But in many cases, no, in every case, they were just disregarded. Uh, you know, in World War I, if you were black, for instance, the 369th in New York, the infantry division, you didn't go under a white general. They sent you to Europe to be under a French general. And what some of the first soldiers to face the front lines were the African Americans. And in fact, they served so bravely. One unit, the 369th, almost every one of them got France's highest award, the Croix de Guerre, the Cross of War. But Henry Johnson got it with a palm leaf, which is very, very unusual. So I uh, said, this, is, this, this can't go unanswered, and started really raising hell. And I figured how Congress worked that if you don't get any action, but if you get 218 members to sign, you can get a discharge petition and then force action. So we put the bills in, but then to get those bills passed, Congress wasn't ready to do it, we had to get signatures. When we got up to 180 signatures, I'm like a staff person walking around, I told Mickey, you do some, I'll do a lot more to get these signatures on the House floor. And when we got to about 180, we put out a uh, press release and they get a call from the Secretary of Defense, Carlucci. Joe, you're causing a big problem here. You know, you're a troublemaker, in effect. That's what he said. Why don't you come to my office? And I said, I got to go with Mickey. Yes, bring him with you. And let's see what we can do. Many discussions. They didn't want to do anything. And then he comes up with what I thought was a Solomon-like decision. Joe, if you cease and desist with these signatures, because the military is really up in arms on this, I will give a grant to a black university, they picked Shaw University, to do a study on every African American that got our nation's second highest award, because the ones that didn't get the first usually got the second. I think in every case got the second, but there were many more that deserved the Medal of Honor. So they did that, and right now, because of that, we're up to nine medals. The first one we got by accident, World War II, because in starting the study, and by the way, before the study started, Mickey Leland, my partner in this, died delivering food and medicine to poor people in Ethiopia. And that was in 1989. So you'll see the front of my little brochure, his pictures there, I think he was 44. I continued this in his memory, and I'm still doing that. And I hope that we get that last medal from our African-American president, President Obama, and that's Seaman Dory Miller, because we have uh, Pearl Harbor coming up, the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, our president's going to be in Hawaii. I've spoken to the African Americans out there. I don't know whether you know uh, Mrs. Joyner, uh, Marsha Rose Joyner. She's been writing about this for a long time. And she's so excited. She wanted to come. But she's working with me because we both concluded the president can issue these medals. Why do they have to go to the Army and the Navy? If the president can give a pardon to a criminal, the president <laughs> can give a medal to a war hero. Answer me this question. This is fascinating, but why was there so much resistance? Well, you know, the military, I think, and I'm not going to demean the military per se, but I think that when they make a decision, they don't like to go back on that decision. And 
it was like a fait accompli and let's move forward. Okay. I didn't accept that. Can I speak to that? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Medal of Honor is rare. In World War I, there were approximately 100 Medals of Honor received by all of the soldiers in the American Expeditionary Forces. Compared to the Distinguished Service Cross, there were over 6,700 of those. So you get some sense of how, and of course, Pershing often named these Medal of Honor recipients to his 100 heroes of the war. So this is a, a fraternity of honor, of heroes. And to admit a black to that fraternity would be saying something about the performance of a black soldier that the Army wasn't willing to admit. And one of the things they did after the war, as a matter of fact, was to demean the service, the heroism, the gallantry, the, the, you know, the sacrifice and service that these men gave, and no one had a Medal of Honor to sort of gainsay that no, They could not deny someone's heroism if they gave them a Medal of Honor, and that is the main reason why they did not. Well, my, my feeling, Sean, well, hang, hang on one second, because, yeah. because I want, while you're on that, I, I want to ask you, the U.S. entered World War I in 1917 uh, under Woodrow Wilson, who vowed to make the world safe for democracy, and yet, Jeffrey, this was the man who was known in some circles as a progressive and yet, you finished the sentence for me. Well, I mean, he was an arch racist. Um, he showed the or screen Birth of a Nation at the White House in 1915. He was a historian as well and said that Birth of a Nation was history written with lightning and also true. Um, he uh, segregated uh, the government in Washington. Um, if there were any... Uh, civil service members left uh, because he fired so many uh, who uh, had been there. And, and you talk about, you've talked about, um, uh, Joe mentioned, you said I could call you Joe, right? Yes. Joe mentioned the Quad de sure. Guerre, which uh, some of the black soldiers, one of the black soldiers at least, earned. And he came out of an organization uh, that was called, what was it called? Harlem Rattlers. Right. Well, yes. Henry Johnson uh, was so a member. This was in the World War One. Right? Yes, of the 15th New York National Guard, the first Black National Guard uh, unit recognized in the state of New York, and that wasn't until 1916. It became the 369th Regiment, better known as the Harlem Hellfighters, uh, but they called themselves the Rattlers, uh, and that was their icon. And it's a uh, a nod to. Gadsden flag and don't tread on me and we see who's carrying that now. It's not black folks. It's interesting how something can be appropriated. Uh, but in any event, uh, Henry Johnson received, as, as a Congressman uh, Diaguardi mentioned, uh, the Croix de Guerre with Palm, which is by order of the Army, which is the highest level uh, that the high, uh, Croix de Guerre is, uh, is given. Henry Johnson got no American honors. Didn't he come home and end up? He died um, destitute in 1929. He ten only years lived 10 later. years after the After, after they the gave war. him a parade on right. Fifth Avenue with his unit. Uh, and, and the all-black unit. All-black unit. Mm -hmm. he, he dies homeless and penniless looking for a pension in Washington, D.C. Would you believe that? That really turned me on to do this. Now, Sam, you, you, you are a media practitioner of recent years, <laughs> uh, not today, but recent years. But I asked you um, to go back for us and tell me what the media, quote unquote, were doing, Don't have the, didn't have the media that we have today, but they were newspapers and radio. Were they covering any of this? For the most part, you had, uh, let's say, two streams of the media because uh, at the time of World War I, uh, the United States was extremely segregated. And um, so you had a black press, which did pay attention to the plight of, um, of the veterans. Uh, and be even before they were veterans, 
um, W.B. Du Bois engaged in a really radical um, argument with the NAACP over whether uh, African Americans should indeed participate in World War I. And uh, Du Bois argued, sort of an, an extension of his talented 10th argument, that they, they should. The, the talented 10th was that the, there, sh there should be a group of talented people at the top who would be the leaders of everybody else. And he argued that it was 10% of the African American community would be that leaders, the talented 10th. Mm -hmm. And how did that fit into the military issue? He felt that that was a place for some of the talented 10th to be able to demonstrate their fitness to be embraced into and show leadership, uh, fitness into the greater community and leadership within the African American community. Uh, that flew in the, uh, in the face of other uh, uh, leaders of that time, including Asa Philip Randolph, who was written up in the um, in one of the New York black publications, black newspapers, arguing against that position. So there was a lot of tension between the two of them. The mainstream media, such as we knew it, you mentioned the the, the white run newspapers and the um, radio, it totally uh, ignored anything that had to do with African Americans in that day. So for the most uh, Americans had no idea that uh, people of color were even in uh, the military or were participating in any level. Now, the, the truth was the, the 369th was a rare because those who uh, tended to be uh, engaged were behind the scenes and did not even get to bear arms. Um, but no one knew about that. And so uh, the stories that was told of um, the, the African Americans who came back um, tended to be told in the black press. So it, the Croix de Guerre was, would have been told? It, it, it most order. certainly would have been told in a black publication, mm -hmm. but nobody would have seen it outside of the, the barber shops and the, the eateries and the places that black people went. It was not something that was widespread among the white, white community at that time. Um, an interesting point about this, though, was because these stories were told in the black press, it heightened something that happened at that, that sort of coincided, which was the Great Migration. Uh, and Isabel Wilkerson's fantastic book, The Warmth of Other Sons, sort of describes that. But World War I uh, and the returning vets gave impetus for a lot of the vets who came back, their stories told in the Chicago Defender, for example, which was widely circulated in the South, led scores, hundreds, thousands of uh, African Americans to flee the South to go to the North because of the way in which some of these veterans told a story of being treated. And Jeffrey, didn't they uh, comprise part of the beginning of a civil rights movement, not the one we know today, but were they not involved in that? Uh, well, Protesting, as he alluded to, uh, sure. segregation? And David Levering Lewis says that the parade that the took place yes, mm -hmm. on uh, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning historian for his, <laughs> his uh, two-part biography of W.E.B. Du Bois, said that the parade on February 17, 1919, actually ushered in the Harlem Renaissance. Mm. Uh, and you should see the way that the press, the white press, describes these men. Some of it's mocking, but you can tell in that mocking there's dread and fear, but others, in other ways, they're describing them as disciplined, as seven foot tall, with glistening bayonets, et cetera, we have to understand that these are men who had been trained to kill, and they killed white people. <laughs> so how do you deal with them, you know, mm. when they come back from Paris, right? Mm -hmm. You can't put them back on the farm, as they say. I'm going to get to Congresswoman Norton in a minute, but let me just go back real quick to Joe DeWarty. There were women, African-American women, too, uh, who served with distinction, right? Are any of them honored? We, there are no uh, episodes that were brought to my attention in World War I of African-American women in the Army. Uh, and in World War II, in the Navy, there are. And we're looking at that right now. I'm joined with, joining with uh, Marsha Rose Joyner. She's been very active in this over the years. And she would have been here tonight. She lives in Hawaii. But uh, she couldn't make it. But I have to comment on something. Because mm -hmm. here I have, listen, I'm someone who's product of immigrants, raised in a, an Italian-American neighborhood in the Bronx, middle-class, hardworking parents who came here 
1929, no education, couldn't speak English, my dad, and yet I got a very good education, Jesuit education, Fordham Prep, Fordham University, and I did not know there was, I'm a congressman, and I have to be told by the father, and David, this is Dr. Leroy's son here with us today, a member of a law firm in New York who's been helping me on this, and I didn't know there was segregation. And until my wife, Shirley, who's kind of an expert in this, got me a book by Eric Yellen, Racism in America, I didn't know that segregation was declared by Woodrow Wilson in 1913 across the whole government. And many black Americans who had survived you know, a failed reconstruction, built up an estate, had good jobs in DC, were summarily fired. And it, it hurt families for generations to come. Mm. And this is something that most Americans don't know. Why didn't I know, as a fairly educated uh, you know, white American, why wasn't I educated that segregation existed in, in World War I, World War II? Mm -hmm. So I think we, we need to understand that there's got to be a lot more dissemination of information if we're going to have right results. Absolutely. Congresswoman Norton, some of these valiant soldiers, as I just indicated, um, were women. Uh, just as they were during your years as a valiant soldier in the civil rights movement. Um, and our dear, late, and much lamented friend, uh, Julian Bond, once quoted an old Chinese saying. He said, women hold up half the world, and in the case of the civil rights movement, it was probably three-fifths of the world. <laughs> and even though he later said he was joking, Stokely Carmichael once said, that the only position for women in the movement was prone. Now, as I travel around the country speaking to students in high schools and colleges, and I say, how many of you know Martin Luther King? Every hand goes up. How many of you know Rosa Parks? Most of the hands go up. How many of you know Diane Nash? Not a single hand. And, but you're not in high school. <laughs> but I'm glad you know. <laughs> and, and there are many others. Brenda, you know Brenda Travis? Who? Uh huh. <laughs> so my question is um, why is that? And what is the consequence? Who do they need to know about as women who held up three fifths of the sky? Well, at least you can say with respect to the armed forces, that women were excluded virtually altogether, whereas the men were, just, were simply discriminated against on the basis of their color. So we're, we're now getting to the point where we want women in combat, and there's even a <coughs> proposal uh, to draft women as long as you're drafting men. Of course, we're not drafting anyone at the moment. Uh, every single ever, uh, endeavor in society essentially reflects the society itself. Some of those endeavors are more enlightened than others, uh, but you will never find one, even a movement like the Civil Rights Movement for Freedom and Justice for Everyone, which does not reflect the society in which it, from which it comes. And so, yes, in the Civil Rights Movement, women uh, tended to play lesser roles. Um, but it must be said of the Civil Rights Movement that uh, when women insisted they were heard. And Diane Nash is perhaps the best example of the bravest person in the civil rights movement. Remember, this is when the sit-ins began, and nobody knew what risks people were taking. And she was the leader uh, of the, of the sit-in movement. And wasn't it Ella Baker who taught Julian and the others that the movement was about more than a hamburger after the sit-ins in Nashville? She taught them, did she not? Well, Ella Baker was, was the kind of godmother of the movement and indeed suggested no, uh, this, this of course is a woman who had played a, a, an outskirts role, forgive me that term, in the civil rights movement itself. Uh, when she saw that students were beginning to organize, she suggested that they needed their own <laughs> arm. Uh, and it was out of her suggestion that that first meeting they called together the students who had been involved in sit-ins to come and form what became known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. 
that was a very important, had no student arm, in other words. That was a most important endeavor. And it took a woman who had been on, brilliant woman, by the way, who had been on the periphery of the civil rights struggle because she was a woman, to understand that these young people were going to be on the periphery, too, if they didn't form their own organization. But it was only recently that Judy Richardson, um, I think sometime in the last three or four years, actually wrote a history of the women in the movement. Why is that? Well, the movement, like most other endeavors, uh, had as its major figures men. I mean, the reason is that the women in, in the civil rights movement have not been leaders of that movement for the most part. So it's not as if there were a whole bunch of women leaders and nobody noticed them. The civil rights movement reflected in its leadership the society. And, and she wrote about women in the movement. They were not major figures in the movement for the most part. Major figures in the movement were men. They're the bravest figure in, 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 in the entire movement. It was a woman who started it all, Rosa Parks. But when you come forward <laughs> and you have the so-called kitchen cabinet, uh, all of whom were men except for Dorothy Height. Dorothy Height once said that uh, whenever they took a picture of the people meeting at the White House, uh, she was always on the end and never got in the picture. And so she said, and so one day I decided I was going to change that. I moved to the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Stephen, tell me, your perspective and um, what, where you think the movement began to really make a difference that helped lead to your election in Nevada, or did it? Well, absolutely, and first I wanna just say how honored I am to be able to participate on this panel and to hear firsthand the history and to congratulate my colleague, former colleague, um, for the work that he's done along with uh, one of the first uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. So thank you. Thank you, welcome. You know, I know we're still digesting uh, yesterday's election and- for, And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Believe me. So I, I come from the West and uh, representing uh, a state like Nevada where I was born and raised, uh, we are really what is the new majority uh, in that to be elected to office, you have to have the support of a coalition of African American, Hispanic, Asian American, and white voters uh, to be elected to office. Uh, I represented a district that was 52,000 square miles that was rural and urban, that was majority white, uh, 40 Five, 46% white, 26% Latino, 15% African American, 7% Asian. That's the new majority. And whether it's Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, soon to be Arizona, states like that, uh, it's gonna be this coalition of uh, population and constituent groups that are going to carry on the legacy that's been started with uh, this incredible history. But um, we also have, though, segregation. And whether that's, you know, cities like Philadelphia and then everything around it, or Detroit and everything around it, and whether it's the legacy of some of these uh, policies or um, actions that were taken in the past. When people are asking today, why is it that we're so divided as a country? It's because of our history as a nation. And yesterday, as Van Jones said, we got white lashed by America. And it hurts. Well, that brings me to this next phase of our uh, conversation because we have had comments like that. I have been sort of nonstop watching everybody on television try and figure out what happened, but not so much how Donald Trump got elected, but what happened to the country 
in the process. And what you've just said and what Van Jones said, that's one explanation. Uh, another has been fear, fear of the changing demographics. I mean, you say it's already happening in, in your part of the world. Uh, certainly by the next 20 to 30 years, the white majority now is going to be a uh, minority and people of color are going to be the majorities. But I'd like to have each one of you speak to what it is that you think happened in this election, not who had the best campaign or what, 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 but what happened among the, the constituents? What happened among the people? Why was this such a contentious, awful election? And what, it, what was it within the population that emerged in such a way that that's all our media <laughs> talked about practically? Eleanor, you have a con? Yeah, well, this notion of light lashing, I don't believe is the best way to understand what happened. And maybe this reflects the kind of analysis I bring to issues like this out of the civil rights movement. Um, we're talking about white men. We're talking about uh, a period that begins to emerge now after the country has elected twice the first African American president. Many of those who voted would have been among these white men. Who are they? Yes, they are anxious, caught in the anxiety of, of a, a transformation in the country where they're no longer in charge. But it's more important than no longer being in charge. It's what has happened to them economically. So the whole notion for a white man in America that you no longer experience automatic increases in your standard of living, which has been there since the beginning of time in this country, has finally settled in. And this generation who are at the, the forefront of this concern uh, will never ever have the ability to have a job with very little education, making a lot of money which is, of course, what unions got them. Um, and they look at their sons, and they see that if they themselves uh, are not trained as they probably are not, they too will not be able to inherit what has been almost automatic. And I think that what Trump spoke to, he cannot deliver, but what needed they needed to hear, they felt they needed to hear, and I don't know what's gonna happen when, when he does not re-deliver the manufacturing jobs, which not only are gone from the United States, but gone from the last place they went, off to yet another place. Uh, but it, 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 it's important, uh, it seems to me, to understand who, that these people were led to where they are by leaders, especially members of Congress, who seeing the best way to gather majorities in their own caucuses or parties was to lead uh, with the extreme notions that have manifested themselves now in the population. They didn't start down there. They started with leadership. Well, let me ask you this, though, because I'd like to, I, I do a series, and here goes my uh, charge for tonight's performance. <laughs> I do a series on uh, the PBS NewsHour called Race Matters, and we look at solutions. So my total focus right now is on solutions. And one of the questions I have about this is, to be sure, everything that you've said is, is ac absolutely the case. But a lot of these people, at that so white people, at that socioeconomic level, have the same uh, a group of people like them who are African Americans. Why is it that those people, because Reverend Barber down in Carolina is working with 
lower income whites and lower income blacks and helping them to understand that their issues are similar. You want to speak to that? Yeah, what, I, what, how do you do that? How do you get these people to understand that they have the same issues and they should be working together? A line of work that I'm very interested in right now sort of is an outgrowth of my days as a journalist and it has to do with storytelling, the, the, the narrative. There is a, as the Congresswoman says, there is a narrative about what it is to be an American. And I like to call that narrative sort of the Marlboro Man, the sort of rugged individualism that if you've got a gun, you've got a covered wagon, you've got a docile spouse and a hound dog, you can tame the Wild West. And we have told that story in one way or another. We have, have glamorized that story. We have exported that story through our media and our performing arts to the point where we believe that is what it is to be a white American, that you can do anything just through the, the sheer grit and your determination, when in fact that story was never true. The story that really was was that there was a, to use an outdated term, there was a village that created, there was an infrastructure, there was a government that allowed for the manifest destiny of the, the expansion in the country. But that's not the story we told. There were, there were immigrants who built railroads that built the West. Um, that's not the story that's told. The, sto the story is told of an individual. And I think that we have to figure out, and I think it's going to be a lifetime of work, of reinventing the American narrative that is more inclusive of the changing new America that we're talking about. But whose responsibility is that? Joe, do you have a comment on that? Well, I, I think about why was I able to walk across the aisle and, and deal with so many African Americans in Congress, whether it was Ron Dellums, whether it was Major Owens, Adolphus Towns, and Mickey Leland. Uh, and it had to do with the neighborhood I was raised in. I was raised in the Bronx in a racially, religiously, and ethnically mixed neighborhood. Dad had a, uh, a food market. By the way, he came here speaking Albanian and Italian, not English, believe it or not. And I see my Albanian friends here, so I wanted to let them know that I haven't forgotten that part of my history either. But the, the point is that I think that we have slipped. And when I think about what I didn't know about the history of African Americans, and yet learned as a congressman and through my wife Shirley, who published, she's an independent scholar, human rights activist, and she published the Lawrence Hill books, uh, political, uh, domestic, and, and international politics, specializing in African-American and African studies. And I don't want to read you the big book she had by John Carew and Asada Shakur. OK, you but, can now go home. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that, that I, I didn't know enough and yet now, looking back, I see the problem more than ever before. Because you went from the Civil War, failed reconstruction, then a, a, a stone wall called segregation set us back for years. And then the first thing that happened was a civil rights movement that was a push against institutionalized racism in America. But we're slipping. I see now in the neighborhoods segregation in the schools, and this has got to be confronted. Because if we can't live together and understand, like I did as a young man in the Bronx, delivering orders to, to, to African Americans and see them coming back at night with a, a dish prepared for my father because they respected him as a guy that was working there 60 hours a day, you know, these things don't leave you. And, and I think that we're not getting enough interaction and sharing of the American experience you know, across racial lines and ethnic lines. Well, one of the ways that that was done back in Eleanor in my day, and maybe some of you here, not you, you're too young, uh, <laughs> during the Civil Rights Movement, you had leadership. So where is the leadership now, Jeffrey? And, and who has to take charge of the kinds of things that need to happen to bring this country back uh, together? It's dif difficult to have the kind of leadership that we had in the civil rights movement when you're fighting marshmallows. The target is not as hard as it used to be in terms of 
um, codified segregationist laws, et cetera. Um, we don't have that anymore. So we have to have different approaches to the problems that exist. But I want, want I, 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 I want to support Congressman Horford's analysis. I won't use that term, white lash. But Trump waged a racist campaign. He came out against Mexican Americans first. He came out against Muslims. Uh, uh, he came out against immigrants and a, a, a broader Syrians, et cetera. Um, he talked about making America great again. To me, that's a euphemism for making America white again or taking back uh, our country, which is something that I hear coming out of those who uh, uh, support Trump. 53%, I've heard between 53 and 58% of white women voted for Trump. So we can't put it all on white men. Um, and so white women really let Hillary uh, Clinton down. And of course, Cornell Belcher said last night, when asked why was that by Judy Woodruff, that uh, race trumps gender. Uh, so I, I, I think we can, and I think the election was really a repudiation of Obama. Um, and uh, there were a lot of angry people that, that, that Trump was able to tap and bring all of that resentment uh, to the surface about So, so Obama. If, if the resentment is beneath the leadership, how do you, how do you deal with it? Because we hear... Uh, President-elect Trump today sounding very different from how he sounded during the campaign, which may or may not signal a new Donald Trump. But let's just take that off the table for now. We've got a Republican Congress now. We have people out there who are feeling their oats one way or the other. How do you deal with this? What are the steps that have to be taken now to try really to bring the country together? Or do we forever have to live <laughs> towards creating a more perfect union, realizing we'll never be perfect? I would just offer that before we jump to how we all can just work together in harmony, we do need to confront the racist uh, nature that exists in this country. And the fact that we say we want to have a conversation, but every time we bring up the topic, people get nervous. And I think President-elect Trump, as hard as that is for me to say, um, did run a campaign demeaning the sacrifice of the first African-American president in this country. He tried to de-legitimize de -le the first African-American president. And he did tap into um, a feeling that exists primarily in rural and suburban white America. That's who elected him president. But there were blacks who voted for him. Well, there weren't a lot of blacks that voted and, for and, and, and Eight, let's some not, did. Eight percent. Eight, and, and that is such a small number. And so rather than focusing on why did the black people vote in that way or why did the Latinos vote this way, why not ask the question, why did those rural white voters and suburban white voters feel the way they did? And do they agree? Because I don't believe all of them are racist like Donald Trump ran his campaign, but they voted for him and supported that uh, agenda and that direction for I our country. I want to say something about solutions. <laughs> you talk, we've talked about leadership, and, and you, you asked about solutions. Well, look, the notion about a conversation has been going on for now hundreds of years. So it's going to go on in some form or fa fashion. It's going to be on the, on, on, on the media. It's going to be on the social media. So that's going to happen. The burden is at the top. Donald Trump has a perfect opportunity. And it would signal a change that would be heard around the world. If he himself were to begin the presidency 
on a note just the opposite of how he ran. Most powerful man in the world now could do it, could do it by what he says, by who he appoints, uh, by, in essence, using the presidency to show that once you get the presidency, you act really like a president. Solution can, you can't go to people who are hurting, including white men, who see their standard of living as slipping and saying, why don't y'all have a discussion about getting along? It's got to start at, at the top. And the very top is the presidency. And the burden is on people like me as well, not to, not to, <laughs> to, to act like I'm still in this campaign. Uh, the campaign is over. If the campaign is over, uh, what is the next thing you want to do? Now, one, one, one of the, 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 the uh, if Hillary had been elected, I would have hoped that the very first thing she would have done, and she began to talk that way, mm -hmm. is to speak about healing. I've not quite heard those words come out of, out, of, out of Trump's mouth, but that's where he needs to be. Well, it's been a very short time. Let me ask you this, uh, Sam Fullwood, and again, remembering that we are in a, his a building that looks at history. And I want to go back briefly before we go to the audience. And by the way, can you all start getting any questions you have together? We've got mics on either side of the room. And like I've asked the panelists prior to them coming out here, I want your questions to be pithy and brief, OK? So uh, Sam, 1968, riots all over America. Kerner Commission appointed by Lyndon Johnson blame said we were moving in two separate directions, two societies, one white and prosperous, one black and in decline. Well, now we have a black that's in decline and a black that's uh, doing not too badly. We've got a black middle class. But I want to go to media, because in 1968, the Kerner Commission blamed the media in part for failing to point out the troubles that were happening in those African-American communities that eventually spilled over into riots. And that the recommendation was to have more people who look like them uh, in those institutions, in those media organizations, so that they could begin to tell you what's going on before it spilled over. Now, Mike Oreskes, who now is, was with the Times, is now with uh, National Public Radio said the same thing the other day, that there needs to be more people in these communities who understand what's happening so that they can put out the words so that everybody can deal with it. What do you, what's your comment on that? The, Is the media, are the media, and I know we're making a big generalization, I hate that kind of generalization, the media, but for purposes of a brief conversation here, how much of the media to blame for what's happening out here and what just happened? Especially because, sorry, especially because they created one of these candidates. I, I don't want to come across as defensive, although I'm not in the media anymore, but I spent 30 years of my life um, reporting uh, about race in America and abroad. Um, and I hear the complaint that uh, the media are to blame for this. And I, I bristle a little bit when I hear that, largely because um, that, I think, imputes on the media far more power than they actually have. Um, I have argued that the media are a, a slightly lagging indicator of where the people themselves already are, in the sense that uh, you can write a story and um, for the most part, if people don't like that story, they tune you out or they ignore you. Um, and editors and television producers and people who are charged with being in the media are very sensitive to sort of trying to get that, that friction point for where the public wants and what will sell. And that's, that's where we have gotten to now with a media that is in complete free fall. There is no um, economic basis for our media that we saw in 1968. In 1968, most uh, newspapers had something like a 50 
or six or forty percent return on their investment. Today, it's somewhere well in low single digits, and that makes a real difference in terms of how you try to hold on to your audience. So, what you have now, also, you have a diversity of, of media. Yeah, I was about to ask you. You because, have you have because you, uh, Twitter. And the 24-hour news cycle has just completely upset the industry. Or you can have industry. some guy in his mother's basement, in his pajamas, putting stuff out and getting as many readers for a particular story as the New York Times can. And that has a, a profound impact because the New York Times may pick up that, that pajama boy story and that becomes the, the talking point for the next day. Now, we don't know who pajama boy is. And we also don't know whether what he said is true or not. But that then gets into the, into the viral news system, mm -hmm. and people are talking about it in a way whether it's true or not true. Well, going to um, uh, solutions, I read a comment in um, one of the, uh, I think it was journalism uh, the yeah. other day, uh, from Vernon Jordan, who said, it's up to the people in the worlds of technology, media, and telecom to solve it, saying that they are the people who discovered fire and now they must ensure they are protected from the fire. <laughs> so he's putting it right on the media leaders uh, to, to resolve this. Let's, let's go to briefly to the audience. My question is around Christian values. So um, I think Christians have been heavily persecuted throughout this whole election based on Trump and Hillary. But when you go to like issues of abortion and this and that, how do you guys kind of um, either uh, educate or help us understand um, some of these things and allow us to keep our Christian values as human beings and as a nation. Anybody want to take down that one? Um, Joe, you, I think uh, our Italian Bronx Italian Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, the best way to do that is by being a good model, you know, doing things right. I'm proud to say that I had an eight-year Jesuit education because these are the Marines of the Catholic Church. You can't become a Jesuit priest unless you have 13 years, two PhDs. People probably don't know that. And it's very rigorous to go through a Jesuit education. But you come out with values. You understand what justice means, what truth means what being fair means. And I think that we need to go back into the education of this country to make sure that no matter where you're educated, that these values come out and that people are put in positions of teaching that are models. We find sometimes that those people become predators. It's happened in Westchester County just recently. So how do you stop that? I don't know. But I think that we've got to make sure that whoever we lift in front of the young people especially are people with high ideals, good ethics, and, and wonderful feelings for fairness, justice, and the truth. And I know that's the way I was raised, that's the way I was taught, and I think that's one of the things that made me a very good congressman. Have we given up hope in trying to resolve racism in this country? Well, <laughs> Well, I found my niche in this issue, and that's military justice. I cannot say I have a solution for racism. I know how I feel, I know what I've done with my life, but I'd like to inspire young African Americans to understand that there are many heroes they should look up to. You know, the general, the, the Greek general, 450 BC, Pericles, he didn't waste a minute to go to the funeral of a soldier who died in battle. And he said something very important. He said, shame on the country that has no heroes, but double shame on the country that has heroes and doesn't recognize them. So my role is, and that's why I put this little book together. I hope you take many copies with you. I made 300, they're not 300 here. And look at what I had to do with, with the help of good people like Mickey Leland and, and others, and, and, and Dr. Leroy Ramsey, to light a fire and, and to not stop until we got the first one and then other things started to happen. And it's only a year ago that I attended the ceremony at the 
White House of President Obama for Henry Johnson. It took all that time, and I started with him. And now we're going to work on Dean, uh, Dory Miller. So I think I'm positive about what I can do to find more of these heroes and then to advertise them and to make sure that all Americans, not only just young black Americans, but certainly young black Americans who seem to be really in desperate straits now in, in the neighborhoods, the, the, the things that I see on TV, that they understand that there are heroes that they should be really proud of. And I think that will make them better people. Thank you. Stephen? So my hope lies in what I'm looking at. The fact that all of you are here to listen to this conversation and some of you to participate in it. My hope is that you will take it with you when you go wherever you go, when you leave here and do whatever you do and continue to help us strive towards a more perfect union. I thank you. Thank you.